Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Prasad Kata. Dr. Kata is an endocrinologist and medical director of the Washington Hospital Outpatient Diabetes Center. So what's the definition of diabetes? It's a disorder of abnormal blood sugars. You know the blood sugars go high and that's what we concentrate on getting them down during diabetes. So when your blood sugars are above 126, someone is considered a diabetic or in the last few years, I think six, uh, five, six years ago, a ADA also said that if your A1C is greater than 6.4, you're diabetic. And I'll go into what A1C means a little later on. It's the average blood sugar for the last three months. I'm sure if some, are you, some of you are diabetic or your family members are diabetic, that's the most common <clears throat> indicator we use for to measure blood sugar levels. <clears throat> It's also a defect in insulin production or its use in the body because it's not only there's a lack of insulin, though there is availability of insulin, your body is not utilizing it properly to sort of regulate your blood sugars. And insulin is a hormone made by pancreas to regulate blood sugars. So uh, the pancreas basically sits just below the stomach and in between the liver on the right side and the spleen on your left side. So that's where, and it's a little bit also behind, behind the stomach and below the stomach. So it's a little more deeper in, in, in the abdomen <clears throat> or in the, in the stomach. If you look at what is the lifetime risk for diabetes for people born in the United States in the year 2000, so lifetime risk, we are talking about lifetime risk is in their lifetime. It's not that when they're 20 years or 25 years or 30 years, they become, they become diabetic. It's in their lifetime. So it's pretty much one in three Americans will become diabetic in their lifetime. One out of two Hispanic females. And if you look out in two out of five African Americans or Hispanics, doesn't matter the gender. So this is as per the CDC in the year 2005 and 2006, they published this and this is what it is. So if you look at the prevalence of diabetes in 2020, this is the Center for Disease Control. I'm sure a lot of you are hearing about CDC for other reasons. CDC also looks at the National Diabetes Statistics Report. And out, if you look at the, the number of people who are diabetic, about 34 million are diabetic and it's about 10.5% of the US population. And out of which about 27 million are diagnosed and undiagnosed is about 7.3 million, about 21.4% are undiagnosed. That is again in the, in the diabetes prevalence population. And pre-diabetes, that is these are patients who are not diabetic, but they're also not normal. They are, their blood sugars are above 100, because 99 is the cutoff for normal blood sugar, and they are less than 126, so, so they're between 100 and 125. Or we also look at A1C, and then we say the A1C should be 5.7 to 6.3, because 6.4 or above is considered diabetic. So about 88 million people, that is almost about 35% of the adult US population, who's 18 years or older are, have prediabetes. And if you take 65 years and older, about 24 million of people who are age 65 or older are prediabetic. So definitely it's a, an ongoing problem and it's a very prevalent problem. So we have to focus on taking care of these diabetic patients because in the long run, they have, can have issues with their kidneys, they can have issues with their eyes, with their nerves, and also with uh, they are more prone to heart attacks and strokes in the long run. So that's why we need to definitely take care of 
these patients. So what are the risk factors? The means the mainly I would say concentrate on the inactivity, race, stress, obesity, and to some extent family history. Family history, actually, if you look at it, there have been some studies which says only 25, 20 to 25% of the risk comes from family history. But the more prevalent risks is the inactivity, obesity. Those are the ones which we do it to ourselves. And that, that is more important risks. And we have to take care of those risks because these are the ones which are modifiable. The family history, you can, you can change that. We were already determined to who are predetermined who our parents were, so we can change that. But we can definitely determine whether we are active or not, or, or if we can lose weight, things like that. And also with respect to stress, how can you manage that and so on and so forth. And obviously age is a risk factor. Race also is a risk factor, which can, you cannot change. Certain medications, if you're taking, can also predispose you to diabetes. And pregnancy, again, is a risk factor because of the hormones which are prevalent when, the, when, a, when a woman is pregnant, that can make them more insulin resistant. So for that reason, so their blood sugars can go higher. So this is a cartoon usually I put up. Basically, you're going to a beach, but again, you probably want to walk around the beach, do something more active, maybe go into the water, things like that, rather than this person, this cartoon shows that he has a hot dog in his left hand and a soda pop in his right hand. And so that leads to the pancreas pretty much going to strike and not producing insulin. And also your insulin, if it is being produced, it does not get utilized by, by the body to control the blood sugars. So this is the other way of showing the evolution of mankind. And if you look at it, uh, 2.5 million years, we started as a hunter-gatherer. And right now where we are in this space, and again, this is an old TV, probably in the 80s or 90s, but TVs are more flat. Now we also have Uber Eats and what not. So everything is there for us to just sit down and enjoy and not do any, any, any kind of physical activity, which we don't want actually with respect to in treating diabetes. So I will just jump to the medications. So the medications which some of you or, or your family members have used probably in the past or using now, the older medications, the most common medication is is, belongs to the group called biguanides. You don't need to remember that, but the common medication is called metformin. I'll be discussing that a little bit later. I just wanted to mention that this is, belongs to, this is one of the first medications we use with respect to treating diabetes. The sulfonylurea group, uh, this is a, the biguanides or the metformin works on the, sorry, uh, works on the liver. The liver produces glucose when we don't eat. And it works on the liver to produce the, to produce less glucose. So the su next group is the sulfonylurea group, and uh, the medications which belong to this group is uh, glipizide, glimepiride, or gliburide. So these group of medications work on your pancreas to produce more insulin. These are also more commonly used. Both metformin and this group of medications are are generic medications. So they are fairly cheap. Even if you someone doesn't have insurance, you can probably get it for a three-month supply for maybe ten to twenty dollars in Walmart with a prescription. So it should not be an issue at all. Even if you, someone doesn't have insurance, the other one is the it's called tyrosolidinediones, the pyoglitazone or Actos, and the other medication is Avandia. We don't use Avandia that much anymore. Some of us do use the pyoglitazone or Actos that also is a generic medication and it basically reduces your insulin resistance. The fourth group is the meglitinide group. You don't need to remember the name, uh, but some of the medications in this group are what is called as natiglinide and ripaglinide. These are medications which we take three times a day, usually with meals and has to be taken like five, 10 minutes before you eat. And the next group is called the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, acarbose. Again, this has to be taken three times a day. It works mainly on the intestines, 
just to prevent absorption of some of the starches. And um, some of the side effects of this medication, again, is gastrointestinal, like bloating sensation, feeling full, things like that. We don't use that that often. Some physicians do. I myself don't use it that often. And insulin. Insulin has been there for a long time. To be frank, insulin has been there since 1940s. So that is still an older medication, I'm saying, but the older insulins are NTH and regular insulin. The NTH looks cloudy. The regular insulin looks clear. And we also have the, the Lantus. Lantus has been there for almost 20 years right now. So that is also an insulin, a long-acting insulin. And the other short-acting insulin, like Humalog and Novalog, they've been there for 20 years or more. So all these insulins, uh, the long and short-acting insulins, at least three of them have been there for 20 years or more. Okay, so again, I will go through all these medications one by one. I'm just uh, sort of mentioning them right now. The newer medication, 2005 or later. So the DPP-4 inhibitor group, Again, some of you may be on this. These are the medications which belong to this group are Genuvia. Uh, this is the most common one in that group. Onglyza. The other one is called Tregenta and Nessina. All these medications are taken only once a day. Again, as I said, I'll be going a little bit more in detail in each of these groups. The GLP-1 group, which is actually an injection, but they're not insulin. So... If you look at this, this is the, the Trulicity, which is once a week injection, the Ozempic, which is also once a week injection. And there are, there's another one called Bidurion, which is once a week. We're not using that that much anymore. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. And the Ribulsus is an oral medication. So you may have seen ads about Trulicity, Ozempic and Ribulsus in the TV. They have ads all the time for these medications. And the next group and is called the SGLT2 group. And that is, again, an oral medication. And the medications which belong to this group is Invokana, Farsiga, Jardians, and Steglatro. All these medications work on the kidneys. They work on the kidneys. Again, I'll be talking about more detail later on. Insulin long-acting. The newer insulins are Tujeo and Triceba. Some of these insulins work for almost 30 to 34 to 36 hours. So if you take it once a day, you're absolutely fine. You, you, should, you should be fine depending upon how many units you're taking, things like that. But again, if you eat, you may have to take, more than likely have to take short acting insulin or you may be doing some other medications along with it. The other insulin, which, which is short acting insulin are Epidra, Fiasp and Lumgel. So these are the th three new ones which are there. Again, when I say new, it's been 15, 16 years. The insulin and the GLP-1 combinations, these are combinations of the long-acting insulin like uh, Lantus, and then also the GLP-1 group like Victoza. The Soliqua is not, is a combination of lexicinotide. It's not, it's, it's not here. It's a short-acting GLP-1. And bromocryptine is another one, which is, which is a medication you take once a day. And that also not very commonly used. Some endocrinologists like myself use it. So with respect to metformin, now, as I said, this is the most common medication which is, which is used. Dose is 500 milligrams. It also comes in 850 and 1000. The maximum dose is usually 2,000. You can go up to 2,550. There's not that much difference between the dose of 2,000 and 2,550 as it can cause some more stomach side effects, things like that. That's why we usually stop at 2,000. It's an extended release version, comes in 500 and 750. Usually the extended release causes less stomach side effects like the bloating, and the loose tools, it causes less of it. So, uh, so some patients, we do give extended release. Taken usually once or twice a day after eating. Usually we build up the dose to minimize the side effects. So we start off, let's say one tablet, maybe for a, one, once a day for a week, then we go to two, then we go to three, the third week and four, the fourth week. 
Usually they're large pills and they're weight neutral. And again, as I said, the side effects are gastrointestinal in nature, bloating, bloating can happen and loose stools, diarrhea, things like that. It works on the liver to produce less glucose when not eating, especially in the night and in between meals. And kidney function, what is the importance of kidney function? You may need to reduce the dose if the kidney function is a problem in some patients. It itself does not cause any kidney problems. I get this question asked all the time, does metformin cause kidney problems? No, it does not. So again, myths about metformin. I wanted to just talk about this. Again, as I said earlier, can it cause kidney issues? No, it does not. But if someone has kidney problems, means as we age itself, our kidney function gets worse or less, we, our kidneys function less effectively, we, at some point of time, we may have to decrease the dose. That is not because of the med, we, you're taking metformin, we need to decrease the dose. It's just because your kidneys are getting worse and you don't want to take the same amount of metformin, you, you'll have to decrease the dose. And at some point of time, we may have to stop it. It causes cancer. No, it does not. There are enough studies which shows that it does not get cancer. There, there are some observational studies which actually show that it may protect against it, but we don't have good information regarding any type of cancer. So it does not cause any cancer. Now, there have been recently some recalls with metformin based on which manufacturer you're using related to substance called NDMA. So this is actually uh, like a, a substance which has been impurity, which has been see when FDA has tested these uh, metformin tablets from different manufacturers, some from China, some from India, <clears throat> they have seen this. So that is the reason they say that you have to stop the medication. It's not because of the metformin itself. So if anything comes out, and it has come out in the last two to three years, occurred two or three different times. So the first thing you would want to do is to call the pharmacy and ask them. So if you call your pharmacy, then your pharmacy will know which batch of metformin they have given it to you. If you call your physician, you can definitely call your physician. I'm not saying don't call them but they won't know which, which batch of metformin you got from your pharmacy. So then they'll say again, your physician will say, please call your pharmacy and find out which batch they give, gave you. And then they can figure out if the manufacturer is the one who has the product, which uh, has the impurity or not. If not, you can just continue taking it without any issues. Sulfonylurea group. Again, this, uh, the, the names are glimepiride, glipizide, or gliburide. I usually use glimepiride because it's, uh, I find this too easier to dose and the number of pills are less. So I usually use glimepiride. Uh, taken five or 10 minutes before major meals. Uh, low sugars are a main concern or the side effect if not taken with meals. Again, other side effect is weight gain. You can gain weight, but again, the metformin, as I said, was weight neutral. You, some people may lose weight with metformin, but not a lot. Weight gain definitely can be a side effect and need to be very careful in elderly. I mean, I say elderly, anyone over 65, 70, I would say, and when the kidneys are not working well, because what happens is if the medication is supposed to be eliminated from your system in 24 hours, when the kidneys are not working, it can be there in your system for 36 to 48 to 60 hours. So then it can cause low blood sugars. So that's why I'm very concerned with respect to prescribing it for anyone about 65, 70 years. And especially if their kidneys are not functioning, you have to be very careful in those kinds of patients. So the third group is the meglitinide group. The, these are the two names, the ripaglinide or nataglinide, and the brand names are Prandin and Starlex. So it has to be taken three times a day and it has to be taken five to 10 minutes before eating. 
the way the sulfonylureas and also the this group works the previous group the sulfonylureas and this one it works on the pancreas to produce more insulin so you don't want to take it without eating if you take it without eating you'll have a low sugar so you have to take it with meals or just 5 10 minutes before eating it acts on this these group this group of medications work only for 2 to 3 hours so if you're eating it will work for your meals and then you can you can after 3 hours pretty much the effect is over low sugars again can be a side effect and they are generic but they can be expensive because the insurances try to limit some of the medications so that could be one of the reasons but you should find out from the insurance if it's covered or not and then if anyone wants to use it they can after obviously talking to your physician and the next one is what is called as the group is called thiazolidinediones but again you don't need to remember the name the name is called actos or pyglitazone usually once a day it comes in 15 30 or 45 mg it decreases the insulin resistance in the body so whatever your insulin your body produces it can you it can be used better in controlling the blood sugars and it can cause weight gain and leg edema so that is one of the issues with using this medication and cannot be used if the patient has a history of heart failure or if they have any issues with uh, their heart you cannot you cannot use it their heart function is less uh, we won't use it also can cause bone thinning and very small chance of bladder cancer with high doses so that's why we usually stick to 15 or 30 mg rather than the 45 mg dose the next one is the alpha glucosidase inhibitors um uh, these are rarely used some physicians use it it has to be used three times a day with meals and the gastrointestinal side effects are gas and bloating are the most prominent uh, uh once and it's generic uh, you have to use it three times a day so the dpp4 inhibitor so we are coming to the the newer medications which is like the 2005 and later the genuvia onglyza tregenta nesina uh works on the pancreas indirectly to produce insulin insulin obviously controls your blood sugars and decreases glucagon glucagon actually is another hormone which is produced by the pancreas that raises your blood sugars so if it decreases glucagon it will decrease your blood sugars it's once a day it's weight neutral and side effects are very minimal and can be used in the elderly as even with respect to kidney issues and things like that it can be used but you may have to reduce your dose very rarely can cause inflammation of the pancreas we call that pancreatitis how the patients experience that is it it will it can cause abdominal pain really bad abdominal pain you won't be able to eat and things like that so that 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 can be an issue so the next is the glp1 analogs these are the ones which i told you which are injections there's uh, one more here which is the ribulses i mentioned earlier but i have not put it in the thing here because these are all the injections and the ribulses is an oral medication so initially the one which came out in 2005 was bieta we don't use bieta anymore but it was uh, in the market for about 4 to 5 5 to 6 years and after that came victosa which is once a day and after that we had bidurion which is once a week uh which is is still there in the market uh we had another medication but that's not there in the market called tanzium but trulicity and the ozempic once a week is the most important medications uh, which are which we use now which belong to the glp1 class so ribulses which is an oral medication these are all injections the ones which have uh, documented here are pointed out to you here ribulses is an oral medication and that's a, that medication you can use it once a day in the morning that also works uh, fairly well the next one is the sglt2 inhibitors so none of these are generic they are all brand name so they will be expensive especially if someone is in the medicare population and they're in the donor toll things like that it definitely can be expensive they work on the pancreas indirectly to increase insulin production and decrease the glucagon production 
makes a person feel full by slowing the stomach emptying time. So usually the stomach empties in about 90 minutes. So when, when a person eats, when you're taking this medication, it takes a longer time for the stomach to empty. So they may feel full and they may feel a little nauseous. And also it acts on the brain to make you feel full. So the, by these two ways, a person eats less when they're taking these medications. It definitely can cause weight loss and also in the long run prevent heart attacks and strokes. So uh, until like six, six, probably five, six years ago or six, seven years ago, none of the medications with uh, which were treating diabetes could prevent this, could prevent heart attacks and strokes. So this was actually the first group of medications which helped in preventing heart attacks and strokes. And since then, mm, there are other medications in the same category. The first one was Victoza. The second one is uh, Trulicity. And the third one is again, Ozempic. All these prevents heart attacks and strokes in the long run when you're taking this medication. Nausea and vomiting are the important side effects. Most of the time, patients are able to tolerate the nausea as you continue to take the medications and build up the uh, dose slowly. As I mentioned in DPP-4, it can cause inflammation of the pancreas or pancreatitis, which is again, very rare. As I said, the, the, the patient can have really bad pain in the, in the stomach and not able to eat or drink anything. And definitely we have to warn the patients when they're taking this medication. If you have anything like that, please stop the medication and call the doctor straight away. And this is, I have not seen any case in 15 years. There's a rare cancer of thyroid called medullary cancer. It has been observed in rats and mice that they can cause it, but uh, you don't see the same in human beings as of now. We don't see anything. And it's been since last 15, 16 years, we have been using these medications. We have not seen any increased incidence of this kind of cancer in patients who are using it. The, the next one is the SGLT2 inhibitors. And again, as I pointed out earlier, like the previous GLP-1, none of these are generic, so they are more expensive. The, the, the names of the medications are Invokana, Farsiga, Chardians, and Steglatro. They use the kidney to eliminate sugar in the urine. Previously, until these medications came out in 2013, kidney was a bystander organ. Basically, we only used to tell patients, your kidney functions are getting worse, you need to control your diabetes. So that's what we would tell them. We won't tell them anything else. So since these medications came, came into the picture, we are using these medications not only to control blood sugars, very recently in the last three, four years, and also in the last two to three months, we have found two medications which protects kidneys. So if someone has kidney issues, we can still use these medications and prolong their kidney function by maybe two or three years or three or four years. So this is, a, again, a very important development in the last uh, eight years or something like that. So the way they work is they, when the blood glucose levels are above 180, they make sure these blood sugars are not reabsorbed back into the kidneys, but they are eliminated in the urine. So that's how they work. So you have more blood sugar in the urine. So for that reason, you can have more fungal infections in the private area, that's a side effect, and very rarely some urinary tract infections. So to sort of circumvent that or prevent that from happening, you need to drink more water and you take it in the morning before breakfast. You will also urinate more. So that's why you want to take it in the morning. You don't want to take it in the night because you'll be get, uh, getting up in the night to go urinate three or four times and we don't want that. You want, we want you to have a good sleep. And so that's why we want you to take it in the morning. Again, it's once a day, definitely can cause weight loss. And some of these medications, as I said earlier, can prevent heart attacks, strokes, also heart failure and admissions due to heart failure to the hospital and also kidney disease and pro progression of kidney disease. So again, a very, very important group, which we can use with other medications like the insulin, the GLP-1, and even metformin. So cyclosed, this is uh, only one medication. Uh, there's no group, it does not belong to any group. It's called bromocryptine. It's uh, not generic. Once a day, it's taken in the morning. 
you start with one tablet and go to a maximum of six tablets all at the same time, but we build up each week. So start with one tablet, then go to the second tablet, go to the third, go to the fourth, fifth, and sixth. Works on the brain to help your work, uh, to use your insulin work better in your body. Headaches or dizziness are the most common side effects. So in addition to all these medications, obviously it goes without saying diet, exercise, all those things definitely has to be a part of it. We, we don't want patients to only depend on medications. We want them to have a healthy diet. We want them to exercise. Means at least we say maybe 30 minutes, at least five days a week, if not seven days, and so on and so forth. So sometimes you have to use insulin. When, I, when do you have to use insulin? Again, there's no right answer to this. Can be used at any point when the sugars are not controlled. Most patients and physicians tend to try and use it later in the disease process, but that's not always right. You can use it earlier. There are two types of insulin, long, long acting once a day, most often short acting, mostly used three times a day. And there's, a, there's another mixed insulins also. There's a 70, 30, 75, 25, and 50, 50. These are the long and the short acting are, are mixed. So the insulin use, again, these are the different insulins. Long acting is the Lantus, which is the first insulin which came into the market. Levamir, Tujeo is a long acting glargine but it's also a low volume insulin. It's more concentrated. And Treceba is Digludec, which is the more uh, recent insulin. And the NPH is the older insulin, which looks cloudy. The short acting insulin is Novolog, Humalog, Admilog. This is same, sim, these are similar, but made by a different company. Then you also have Epidra, Fiasp and Lumjev. These are new. The Fiasp and Lumjev are fairly new in the last three to four years. And Epidra is probably like 10 or 11 years and the mixed insulins, as I discussed earlier. So again, usually what we do is, if someone wants to take only two shots a day, we give the 70-30. I very rarely do that because you cannot treat the patients very well with this, these insulins. Most of the time we use a long acting along with a short acting. The short acting has to be used three times a day. If you eat three meals, if you eat two meals, you can only use it two times a day. And the long acting, typically we use once a day. Sometimes we use two times a day. But Tujeo and Traceba, we can definitely get away with once a day without any using two times a day. The next part will be, I'll be concentrating on checking your sugars and what are the options there, meters and the new options like the CGM, the continuous glucose monitors and things like that. So how often should one check blood sugars? It again depends, okay? So it depends on what type of a type of diabetes a patient has, whether it's type one or type two, how controlled the blood sugars are. If you're very well controlled, you can probably get away with even three or four times a week. Or some patients don't even check because their A1C is around six and a half, 6.3, 6.2. It's been like that for two, three, four years. So they, they may not check or they may check only when they eat something out of the way or if they feel funny, which is fine. As long as you still have your meter, which is working and you're keeping that, you, you check that now and then, and you're making sure everything is okay. If there is an emergency or something, something out of the way, uh, whether you're on oral medications or insulin, as I said, if you're on the oral medication, maybe once a day is fine. Or sometimes if you're not controlled on oral medications, you may have to do two or three times a day. If you're on insulin, usually you need to do it more than once. So again, how often should the sugars be checked? Two or three times a day, if you have type two diabetes on oral medications when you're not controlled, or if you have long acting insulin, which is once a day, or you're taking mixed insulins, the 70, 30, 75, 25, or 50, 50, then you may want to do two to three times. And again, I tell my patients, don't take your sugars every day in the morning. It's not like brushing teeth. So you want to check, you would want to check at some other times too. You want to check after eating maybe lunch, after eating dinner or before you go to bed. So that way we know different sugars at different times of the day and whether you're high, low, things like that. Important to check at different times of the day. How often um, sugar should be checked? Again, if you're, if you're three or four times or more, 
If you're type 2 diabetes, you're more than on one insulin, two different types of insulin. If you're type 1 diabetes, when you're on a pump, the insulin pump, and when the patients are uncontrolled, because the first thing we want to do is to try and get you to control. So initially, I tell my patients, if you're not controlled, you may have to check three, four times a day. But later on, once you're controlled, you can cut it down to one or two times or even one time a day once you're controlled. So again, as I was uh, suggest, uh, t- telling you earlier, A1C, we're coming back to the A1C. So A1C corresponds to a blood sugar level. This is what is called as estimated glucose. This is in milligrams per deciliter. This is what we used in US. And if, if you're five, you're 97. If you're six, you're like 126. If you're seven, you're 154. You're eight, you're 183. So that's what it comes come. If you're looking at your A1C, this is your corresponding blood sugar where you are. And this is in millimoles. That's what they use in Europe. We don't need to worry about it. So if someone comes in A1C of 11, they're probably around 270. So that's what your glucose is. So if you don't check, if you're only checking once a day, and that is all the time in the morning, you may be getting 150, 160 sugars, and you may think it's okay, but it's actually not because when you're eating, your blood sugars are going up and they're maybe 300 or even 350. So and that's why your A1C is like 10 or nine or something like that, but you're checking once a day in the morning and you are, you're not seeing the full picture. So this is a slide, it's a, a little complicated, but I'll try and explain to you. So what this slide shows is, if your A1C is more towards 10, like 10 is here, 10.2, 70% of your sugars is being contributed by your fasting sugars, by your morning sugars. So when you're 10, you definitely can see your morning sugars also will be high. But when you come more towards control, 7.3 or less than 7.3, 70 percent of this is contributed by the post meal sugars which are called ppg or post prandial sugars so here if you're more closer towards 9 10 or even eight and a half its majority is by the fasting sugars so if you're more closer towards goal that's less than 7.3 so majority is by the after meal sugars or the postprandial sugars. So that's very, very important. The more closer towards your goal you are, your after meal sugars becomes very important. So for that reason, you have to check at different times of the day, especially if you are even less than eight, less than seven and a half, that is very important. So for that reason, I wanted to put this slide. Even when you are between 8.5 and 9.2, of your blood sugars is contributed by fasting and 45% is contributed by your postprandial. So you're not seeing the picture if you're only checking in the morning. So what do you do with your blood sugars? I usually tell my patients to get their meter to me. I download pretty much most of the uh, brand name meters which are approved by the insurances in US take a blood sugar monitor and also the logbook to the physician office if you're writing down your sugars. Most monitors can be downloaded in the physician's office. Again, these are the brand name meters which I'm talking about. Important to check at different times of the day. So I also say if there is a, I also say if there is input, there will be output, means the input is from you. The output will be from me and probably a collaborated effort from me to you and you, you trying to follow the orders. If the input is greater, the output will be greater. If someone comes with to me with a sugar uh, meter and I download the last month and there are two sugars, I'm not going to do much if your A1C is nine or 10. Yes, I may change some medications. If you're only on one or two medications, I'll just tell your A1C is nine, but it is not based on what your sugars are because there's only two sugars in a month. I'll just base it on your A1C. I usually give an analogy. It's like, okay, if you don't come to me with sugars uh, or if you're on insulin, not checking your sugars, it's like a blind man shooting in the dark. I don't know your sugar, so I can't do much. So you have to come with some input so that we can give you some output and that will help you in the long run. So patients on insulin and the blood sugars act as their story. Watching 
still photographs versus watching a movie. If you check at different times, it's like watching a movie. If you check only once in the morning, it's watching like a still photograph. Again, if there is no pain, I, I know most patients do complain of checking sugars. Again, if there is no pain, there's no gain. So I just wanted to give you some examples of the blood sugars of patients and their A1Cs. A patient with controlled blood sugars in the morning, but a high A1C, 7.9 and on insulin. So the morning sugars are great. These are all the morning sugars, but why is the A1C 7.9? So you go back to the slide here. This is the slide. So from 8.4 to 7.3, 50% of the sugars contribution is fasting and 50% is postprandial. So that's where we are missing the postprandial picture here. So we don't have any postprandial sugars. All the sugars are morning. So we don't know what the sugars are after eating is. So that's why we need after eating sugars. So again, a patient is on long and short acting insulin. If you look at it, his morning sugar 121, no sugar, no sugar, night was 343. So definitely he's high after eating. Next day, his sugar was 208 because he was high. And again, there's no sugar. PM was 343 and there's no sugar in the night. There's no sugar in the morning and he was 124 and 190. And then he was 124 in the morning. He's 211 here, he's high and he has also had a low. So that's why we want the patient to check more often and at different times of the day so that we can see a pattern. So nowadays, when you're on basal bolus insulin, especially for Medicare patients, if you're taking one long acting insulin, two or three short acting insulins, you can actually go on CGM. Again, I say, if it's very important to check both, to both before and after the patient eats, if he is on insulin, if the dietary intake is added, it's an added, another dimension because we don't know what your someone is eating, right? Someday you may eat maybe a salad and a small sandwich or something like that. Next day you may eat rice and pasta and something else. So those also is very important. That information is very important. So as I was saying earlier, if you are on long and short acting insulin, especially for the Medicare patients, and you're taking three injections a day, uh, you, you can get any of these sensors and Medicare approves it. In the last two years, this is one additional advantage for the Medicare patients who are on insulin. You, the first one is the Freestyle Libre. This has been there for almost four years now. And the second one is the Dexcom. It's actually, I, the, the latest one is the G6. They approve that. And these are, this has to be used every 14 days. And every 14 days, you, you apply it to your, your arm um, in, in, and the arm in this area. And uh, the Dexcom is usually in the abdominal area away from your umbilicus. So, and this is every 10 days. So this is a graph from a patient. See, it shows so neatly here. So what it shows is average glucose is 148. 87% of the sugars are controlled here, which is excellent, okay? And the sensor usage is 90%. So that's what we want. And if you look at it, you start 12 a.m. here, 3 a.m. here, 6 a.m. here, 9 a.m. So all these sugars are pretty much less than 180. And when the patient eats here, the patient sugars goes up a little bit after breakfast, then maybe a slightly after lunch and maybe slightly after dinner, but it's not bad at all. It's excellent actually. Based on this, the A1C is 6.8. So that's, that's good. So, and this patient is on insulin actually. So it's great to know you, you can, this is the overall data report. So you can see day by day. You can see when we download 30 days, you can see each day. Let's say someone has a, a day where they went out and they ate outside. We can see that day and we can talk to them. Look, you, you say you went out this day, you, you had lunch outside, dinner outside. So that's why you're high. You have to increase your insulin when you eat out. So we can, we can tell them for sure. But again, these are for patients who are on insulin and if they're taking more than three shots a day. So this is another graph of a different patient. So you can see here, you can pretty much point out yourself, right? So high after breakfast a little bit, but definitely high after lunch and definitely high after dinner. So this patient was told, you need to control your evening sugars. You have to take more insulin for your evening meals. 
If you're taking seven units, you have to go to nine or 10 units. Take nine or 10 and see how things go. So it gives you pretty much all the data here. It gives you the tar 74% in range where high is up to 250. 74, the 74% is up to 180. And very high is more than 250. And it also gives you very low, low and very low. So very low is less than 1% and low is also less than 1%. So which gives you pretty much everything here. So it's a, it's a really, really helpful tool for the patients when they're able to use it. And it also helps the physicians to base their, base their treatment plans, especially if they're on insulin or if they're on other medications to adjust the medications. So this is a different Libre, this is a Libre report. And again, this patient, see, excellent, 88% control. High is only seven, very high is zero, okay? And very low, it says four, Sorry, low is four and very low is 1%. Now, again, the, the glucose readings you're getting here is called what is called as the interstitial glucose. It's not the blood glucose when you prick your finger. So it's from the fluid in between the cells underneath your skin. So there are slight differences. So when you sort of check it, when you scan your meter or when the in Dexcom, it's automatically loading the sugars for you. And when you check your sugar, there can be a little difference. There can be a difference about 20 points, 15 to 20 points, and sometimes even 30 points. But what we need to understand from this is, is basically, when are you going high? Are you going high after breakfast? Are you going high after dinner? Are you going low there? So those are the things we understand from it. And we see the graphs and the summary, and the summary helps us to a great deal. And we also see the graph each day. So to look at it, okay, you're going high after lunch. You may not be taking, you're missing, you may be missing your shot at lunch. So those are the things we can talk to the patient and determine what they need to do. So this is another graph. So you look at it here. So if you check your sugar here, which was good, here was good, not too bad. And here compared to a graph, which gives you this, it tells you that you're slightly high before you woke up in the morning, you're low actually at when you woke up at six o'clock, then after you ate breakfast, you went up to almost 300. Then again, you came down, you had a low, then the, you, you checked it before you had a low. So you really don't know. Then you checked again, maybe after lunch, which was slightly high, but you went up to almost like 300 and then you came back down. So looking at this, the graph is definitely tells you the whole movie of the day compared to the instant photographs of the blood sugars. That is, that's when you check your sugars and we don't know the graph. So again, when you go to your physician, you need to ask about your A1C. A1C measures the average glucose over the last three months. If you get your A1C checked at least twice a year, if your sugars are controlled, that should be good enough. But if your sugars are not controlled, we would say probably four times a year. Sometimes maybe three times a year should also be fine. A1C goal less than seven, preferably less than six and a half, especially if you don't have any kind of other comorbidities like heart or kidneys or things like that. What is the A1C explanation? Basically, it's the sugar coating around the red blood cell. That's all it is. So the red blood cell has a half-life. Its lifespan is about 90 days. So the more the sugar it accumulates over the 90 days, your A1C will be higher. So that is the measurement of A1C is basically the sugar coating around your red blood cell. So that's why we call it hemoglobin is the amount of red blood cells you have in the body. Um, A1C is hemoglobin A1C is the measurement of the sugar coated red blood cells in the body. So again, we went over this earlier. I won't go into that detail again. So this is the estimated glucose and this is the A1C. So how often the A1C needs to be checked? Every three months, if not control or adjusting medications, every four to six months, if stable or not adjusting medications. And that's what I usually follow with my patients every four to six months, if they are controlled, if not every three months, and sometimes even every two to three months, if they're not controlled. And the goals for sugars before, before meals is 130. This is the American Diabetes Association, and this is the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, where they are a little bit more, you can say they're 110, and after me, less than 180, and this one is less than 140, that is the A standards. So 
again, the approach for management of blood sugars, if someone is at a high risk for low blood sugars or have a lot of side effects of the medications, then we may be less stringent on these patients. We don't want to be more stringent in a person who's living by her, himself or herself and is 85 years old, they're taking insulin. I, don't, I, I try to keep their A1Cs higher than seven if they have all these issues. The disease duration, if they have had their disease for 30, 40 years, then we probably keep them less stringent. Their life expectancy, again, if you are, let's say you're 55, 60 years, then we want it to be more stricter. We want it to be less than seven. But if you're 80, 85 years, we want it to be less strict. We want it to be seven, seven and a half, that's okay. Because we don't want you to have low sugars and get admitted to the hospital. This I can club it, uh, relevant comorbidities like kidney issues, uh, blindness, or uh, neuropathy or other uh, like heart attacks, heart failure. If there are, they don't have any of these or none at all, then we are more, more stringent. We want it to be less than seven, probably six and a half. If they are, have more of these complications, we want it to be definitely greater than seven, we are okay with it. Uh, patient attitude and expect, expected treatment efforts. That also you have to weigh what, what their attitudes are. If they're not, if they don't have the right attitude to get it controlled, you don't want to really force them because then they'll completely have aversion to sort of treating their diabetes. So we want to try and take them, educate them and help them with controlling the sugars. And resources and support system. Again, if there are good resources, support system available, like our diabetes education, which is there for you all the time, so yes, we can, we can help them with that and try and get them to goal of seven or less than seven, depending upon uh, all these other factors. So the good news is uh, by managing ABC, again, I'm sure you've heard of this, A stands for A1C, B for blood pressure. Again, the blood pressure goal is less than 130 by 80. You want to make sure you get that checked in the office, preferably after you sit down for a few minutes if your blood pressure is high, if the physician, if the medical assistant has taken it, to ask the physician to check it again. They can check it again at the end of the visit and see where your blood pressure is. You want your blood pressure to be less than 130 by 80 and C stands for cholesterol. And the, the cholesterol, the number you're looking at is for the bad cholesterol, which is called the LDL cholesterol that needs to be less than 70. So if you're able to control these three things and in addition to that, take your medications regularly, exercise and follow a proper diet, we can control the complications in the long run.